Good morning and welcome to this morning's uh, global webinar uh, presented by the OS Foundation. We're happy to have Ken Johnson here to talk to us about RailsGoat. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Ken. Morning everyone. Um, admittedly this is a bit of a strange format to give a presentation. Uh, and somehow, oddly enough, I'm still a little nervous, even over a webinar. But, um, but uh, anyway, so this topic is, uh, the topic we're covering, RailsGoat, um, basically this is a project that was developed to provide open source uh, uh, and free training to Rails developers. Um, there's been some hard work, work on it by a few individuals. And um, I guess we'll jump right in. Uh, after each slide, I will uh, pause for questions. And uh, um, this, this presentation is not incredibly long. So uh, we do have time for a uh, deep dive into the code if anybody wants to go into it. So. All right, so this is a... Uh, RailsGoat is a purposefully vulnerable Rails application. Um, it's kind of important to say purposefully, <laughs> I feel anyways. Um, it covers right now the OWASP top 10. 2013 is on the, on the roadmap, and it's something that is actually being worked on right now on GitHub. So, so if, you, if you visit the GitHub page, you'll see that there is a 2013 branch. Um, it's built for realism and scalability. So the premise is that this is an HR or human uh, resources application. When I say scalability, I mean that the models, uh, that the, they are built to be extended. Um, we use associations between a user and each one of these sections, whether it be performance or you know, benefit related, um, it's incredibly easy to extend and scale. So I bring that up, you know, obviously we're looking for more folks to contribute, so that's why I bring it up. So to get started, I mentioned it's uh, hosted on GitHub. Uh, there is a home page. Don't feel the need to copy the link now. Uh, I believe this presentation is going to be distributed. So you'll be able to look at the link later. Uh, but that is the home page. The, the official home homepage is uh, through OWASP, but uh, I need a little bit more flexibility. Uh, so there's a GitHub page that is the unofficial homepage. The uh, last thing is uh, the reason we chose GitHub was for specifically for collaboration. So um, issue tracking, submitting pull requests, you know, forking and submitting pull requests. Um, we're trying to make this something that uh, is a community project. So roadmap items, things that are coming up. So as I mentioned, we're converting to the OWASP Top 10 uh, 2013. Unit testing, Mike McCabe, um, I, I'll, at the end of the presentation, I'll give you his uh, Twitter handle if you wanted to reach out to him. But uh, there are two different um, unit testing efforts underway. One is uh, security-focused RSpec unit testing, and uh, the um, the other is Gauntlet, which is a rugged uh, testing framework. Um, rugged, it, it, the they call it a rugged uh, a rugged testing framework. Uh, due to the fact it's, I think the, the, the actual mantra is beaming your code. Um, but anyway, so that's something Mike's working on, uh, uh, including in the framework or in the application. Uh, the vulnerable gems, there's been a request for uh, us to include gems that are um, currently vulnerable and also ones that are a little bit outdated uh, just to show uh, issues with previous issues with things like authorization and um, command injection and things like that. And then of course they're going to add more vulnerabilities. 
Uh, before I move forward, I went over a lot in that slide. Does anybody have any questions? No questions. Okay. So when I say more vulnerabilities, what I mean is right now, we, we felt like the immediate need was to get training out there for maybe the more novice uh, programming crowd um, and uh, novice to moderate. And then um, the same, same goes for the security side of it and testing and reviewing code. So that was our primary focus up front. Um, now we're starting to shift into, into the more moderate to advanced uh, tutorials. So this is something that's going to happen over the course of the next probably three months where there are going to be things that maybe are going to be a little bit more subtle. And uh, if you look at the, the tutorials as they are right now, some of these vulnerabilities scream, you know, look at me, I'm obvious. But uh, that'll, that'll, uh, but there will be some changes there. Um, so real specific vulnerabilities outside of the top 10. The top 10 is a great framework for making sure we have sort of a basic coverage of, you know, vulnerabilities and how they manifest in the Rails framework. But it's not all-inclusive, obviously, and there are things that are, that fall outside uh, the scope of that that are Rails-specific and we want to make sure to get, in the, get into the framework. Um, and then metaprogramming vulnerabilities. Um, so there are obviously some ways to shoot, shoot yourself in the foot when it comes to including dynamic user supplied content into metaprogramming code. So those things are going to be covered uh, as part of the moderate to advance um, tutorials. And the last thing is added functionality. Right now the functionality is actually fairly, you know, it's, it's very basic. Um, but as I said, it's extensible. So you'll see that, uh, you'll see the, the application grow in terms of just pure functionality. So before I move on to the next slide, does anyone have any questions? Mm, okay. Nope. All right. This may be a very quick presentation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Rails versions. Right now, the branch is locked in at 3. Uh, sorry, the application uses Rails 3. Um, we plan to, I'm actually, to be quite honest, I'm not sure if I'm going to go with, with Rails 2x or Rails 4 next. It, it might seem like it makes sense to go after Rails 4, but I know that there's a much larger um, group of folks out there using Rails 2 still, just because, you know, it, it was something built initially during the startup phase and then the company grew and then it just kind of got bigger and bigger and now it's hard to upgrade and so um, you know I see the scenario play out quite a bit so I'm actually thinking about moving uh, and Mike and I are discussing this uh, moving forward with Rails 2 first and then coming back and uh, doing Rails 4. But there are uh, Vulnerabilities that are unique to each framework, anybody that's developed in those, uh, those frameworks understands that. So uh, we want to show the vulnerabilities as they manifest within um, each uh, Rails version. So support. Um, all, all of Unix, obviously in Linux, um, we don't have Windows support. And uh, if I'm being honest, I'm, I'm not sure we we will ever support Windows or put any effort into that. Um, maybe someday, but it's certainly not a priority right now. Any questions so far? No. I noticed Mike McCabe is also on the webinar, and I'd be happy to unmute him if he has anything he'd like to... Uh... Yeah, actually, uh, Mike, uh, yeah, let's do that. Let's see if Mike has anything to add. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Cool. Uh, sorry, it's a little loud. I'm in the office. Um, one thing that might make this a little easier is we're looking uh, to add uh, the ability to use Vagrant 
to build an environment with Rails code mm -hmm. already set up. So yeah, instead of needing to have uh, you know, MySQL install, have all the other dependencies installed, you would just basically download a uh, virtual machine with everything, everything already built into it, which would make getting started a lot easier. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's a good point that Mike brings up. Uh, we should definitely uh, make it possible to integrate with Bigger. Uh, and actually, I think ideally, we would probably do something like um, make it easier to get up into the, like an Elastic Beanstalk instance or something like that. I'm sure we can figure something out. Or maybe just provide tutorials on that because I know that you know there is some learning curve there. What do you think about that, Mike? Also, getting it for the you know prepared for the cloud, whether it be tutorials or whatever. Yeah, that's an idea. We could even probably create an AWS image. Ah, yeah. So there's some ideas to throw out there to make this easier. Um, put that on the roadmap. <laughs> Uh, all right, so um, I guess I'll just move forward with uh, um, actually showing you um, two of the two vulnerabilities that I thought were maybe somewhat interesting. Um, so to preface this tutorial, this uh, video, um, essentially we talk about securing your application against timing attacks. So there is um, there's this uh, um, this is for folks that roll their own authentication is what I should say. So uh, when you do that, there can be a tendency to first, for instance, look up the user, and then if they're you know if they exist in the system, then perform some some fun uh, functionality or execute some code. Um, that's a mistake. Uh, it's an issue with timing attacks. So um, we're going to show basically uncommenting uh, the more secure version of rolling our own authentication, commenting out the old one, um, and I'll walk you through what exactly the code is doing. So see here. So this is our baseline authentication method. It's kind of kludgy. It basically it says, you know, you see user equals find by email. So we look up the user by their, the email they provided us when they're attempting to log in. Um, if the email doesn't exist, we tell them that it doesn't exist. That's obviously a, a blatant uh, foul there where, you know, we've, we're, we're basically allowing user enumeration. Um, and then we perform a compare uh, function on the, the, uh, the user's password. So if the user was found, we take their password and we compare it against a poorly, uh, so we use MD5 and that's obviously a, a not the preferred hashing uh, function for their password. Um, but that's what the application uses. So um, we perform that compare uh, uh, function, and then we return the um, the result if uh, if it's um, if there's a true or if there's a match on the user's password and the hash uh, password. So um, that they've provided, I should say. Sorry. Um, so to shore this up. There's a few things wrong with this. Obviously, even if we got so, even if we got rid of the fact that we say whether or not it's an incorrect email or whether or not it's an incorrect password, even if it was a generic error, we'd still have an issue because you'll notice we only um, uh, we only sort of do the compare there um, uh, if the user exists. So let's say where it says Ray's email doesn't exist, we have like you know email or password. There's something wrong with it. Um, uh, because we're, we have this, uh, um, uh, if we were, you know, because we have that race thing, we wouldn't go to the next line and execute that comparison. 
So, all right, I'm going to try and get that to go away. All right. So, after we uh, you know, uncomment this, and by the way, the point of showing you the, uh, the comment and uncomment is that throughout the code, this is done. Uh, there are, there are in, in some cases, there's the just flat out, this is bad code, this is what we're using. Uh, second, you know, then there's a second tier up, a little bit more secure example, and then the last one is um, uh, more advanced, where it says, you know, hey, this is the most secure um, code or method that you could you could create. And I can't say that it does that everywhere, but uh, in in the majority of the of the application that exists, so you can always uncomment, comment at will. Um, So now the self.authenticate method uh, belongs to, to you know, that, that's this method that's actually being used now. So um, what you'll notice is the first thing we do is we do user equals find by email, and uh, we say or the user dot, uh, we create a user with the blank password. So what ends up happening is, um, to go through this, basically the, uh, if the user, if there's no um, user return from the system because the email you provided when, you log, when you're attempting to log in, doesn't exist in the, the system, um, the statement to the right of it will execute. Right? So regardless, the, the, there will be a user object, whether or not that uh, user exists in the system or whether the user uh, is one you created. Um, by using a blank password, when we go to the next line where it says if rack utils dot secure compare, um, and we use uh, the, user, um, the user password, either the user we found in the system or the user we created, and we compare that against the password provided at login, the MD5 hash version of that. Um, the MD5 hash version of an empty string is still an MD5 hash, so it will never match it, right? So I guess what I'm saying is um, this uh, this password. Now the caveat there is if we had for folks a little bit more into or. Uh, familiar with Rails, if we had some kind of before save function where we get a user dot new password and then, um, uh, or sorry, we get a, a on create um, type filter um, uh, in there and, you know, it basically hashed uh, the blank password, that might be an issue. But here all, all we're doing is created just, just a user, uh, uh, sorry, user object in memory, no, um, no actual creation. Um, and so basically right off the bat, we know that, the, that even if, you know, there, there should never be a match for that, uh, that user we've created in memory. That's, I guess, what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, so the uh, secure compare is a feature of Rack Utils. Um, I can actually pull that up real quick. So basically what it does is it, um, it takes the value that you've um, provided, it breaks it down to byte size and it compares against, uh, you know, um, byte size. But it'll always return, um, it'll also basically always take the amount, the same amount of processing uh, time to process. So what that means is um, here, um, there, there will never be a distinction between how long it takes the application to return um, a, a response from a login request. If you provide no user, if you provide a, a, a bad password, if you provide a, a, an email address that doesn't exist in the system, the, the timing will always, there will always be the same amount of time to respond. So um, you cannot enumerate whether or not a user exists uh, in this way. It's a, it's a more subtle uh, portion of coding in Rails that um, is often done incorrectly. So before I move on, are there any questions? I'd be surprised if there weren't any questions on that one. <laughs> no, there are not. <laughs> All right, guys, you're killing me. Somebody's got to have a question here. <laughs> 
that was not the, I know that I had, probably didn't make that super clear, so, um, although I tried. This is a really real, weird format, so, you know, if I'm, if I'm screwing it up, um, I can't look at your faces and know, so just, uh, you know, shoot questions out there, that's the only way I can do it. But, uh, if nobody has anything else, let me hop back up in that presentation. Somehow I close that. All right. So the next uh, the next video is probably just a little bit easier uh, to cover for me, anyways, from this side of things. So um, what we're gonna show here is so before I start the video. I can figure out how to zoom in. There we go. Uh, before I start the video, what I want to explain is the basic premise of this is that we have um, a file that we're going to download. We instantiate. So the way we do this is actually insecure. Um, it's insecure from from two aspects. Uh, from what the first aspect is that you know when you go to retrieve that file, we're going to basically use your user input to retrieve that file. The second part of this, which is the, uh, the part that um, this particular video probably doesn't go into as much, uh, but will be covered in the more moderate to advanced tutorials, is the metaprogramming aspect. Uh, there's a method used in this call called uh, that's dubbed constantize. That's a Rails method. Um, and you basically can create a constant or a class um, uh, from a string. So, I'm going to dig right in and then I'll explain a little bit of that uh, as we go along. So first we uh, navigate to the benefit forms. Sorry, actually first we take a look at the code. The first line here basically says that under the, the Rails application there is a public, uh, you know, public forward slash docs folder. Uh, whatever parameter, or the main parameter that you provide to the application, um, whatever given in that parameter is what we expect. It's going to be part of that path, right? So it's going to be the Rails path um, uh, plus the public folder plus the docs folder and then whatever the file name you get. That's kind of the idea of what that should be. Um, the file equals line. Now this is something that's really not explained too well in this tutorial, um, and but will be. Uh, but basically, we're taking user parameter, uh, uh, sorry, user supplied content from this parameter, this type parameter, and then we're calling constant size on it, which basically um, is a separate vulnerability in and of itself. Uh, so we're creating a class from user supplied content with no no protection, no filtering that you know the user supplied input equals this or that, um, just any class you want to constantize now, you can. So that's, that's an issue. And then uh, when we instantiate that class, uh, we actually pass in user supply input, which is the result of path on the previous line. The way it's in, the intended purpose for this code is uh, from, you know, straight, straight up functionality wise, is that the user gives us the file name, we look on the file system, and we uh, return the, the file object to the user so that they can download a PDF. That's really what, it, what the idea is here. So right here, um, this is the name parameter up there. You can see, uh, uh, and if you're not familiar with what you're looking at, you're, um, this is an intercepting proxy. It sits between your browser and the application and can catch requests that you can modify them before forwarding them onto the application. So 
you can see there's two parameters there, name and type. We discussed both of those. So as we navigate back real quick, if you look at uh, if you look at uh, the, the type parameter in the request that we're sending, it's, it's a capital M, yeah, it's file. So really what you're saying here, when you say file equals, you're saying file equals file.new, and you're giving it the path parameter. Uh, and then the path parameter consists of the public forward slash doc, yeah. forward slash um, health and stuff PDF. It's a really classy name I gave that PDF. Um, couldn't think of anything better. Uh, so we're going to replace that though with um, the location of the config initializer's uh, secret token, the RV. If you're not familiar with this file, there are many good reasons to not store your uh, secret token or incredibly sensitive um, tokens, keys, credentials inside of your source code. Um, you know, it should be a pretty compelling reason. Um, if you're ever able to perform a, a transaction like this where you're you know, basically uh, calling a, basically tra traversing the, the file system to pull a, a file that you wanted, um, and this is kind of a, a concern um, that, you know, why we try to prevent that and, and try to omit those from uh, source and instead call it from, you know, maybe an environment variable, but certainly not keep it from the source. So right here, we're going to traverse two directories back and go to the config directory, initializer directory, and take this secret token. By the way, does that, does someone have a question or? Mm -mm. Okay. No, you're doing great. Okay, so we'll traverse back two directories, grab the, uh, go to the config directory, initializer secret token. And it, it just out of curiosity, can anybody on the line tell me why having a secret token uh, would be important. What I what I could do with that? Mike, you should at least be able to give me something here. <laughs> All right. Well, so the secret token basically has this um, uh, token value inside of it that's used for signing sessions. The way, real, the way Rails works by default, and this you can change this, but by default it stores your cookie on the client side and not the server side. So how that works is um, your browser just maintains your cookie until you know um, expiration, um, and that cookie has some it might have some data in there like your user ID or it might have something in there that, um, that ties you in the database to that, that cookie in that session. Um, so that's just by default. And the way it does that is it does that by verifying the message integrity of the cookie. To create that hash, to generate a, a hash uh, um, and basically make your cookie, it um, does so by using this uh, secret token. So if you steal that, what I'm saying is you basically have the ability to assign um, your own sessions, and that's a pretty powerful thing. Um, you'd be able to uh, become whoever you want on the system, depending on how it's architected. But in more more often than not, you would be able to become whoever you want on the system. So it's rare that I don't see it set that way. It's great for optimization purposes in terms of storing that that uh, cookie on the client, but it um, you have to remember unless you rot rotate that secret token, um, that cookie never really expires. It might, you know, from the user's browser um, disappear, but if ever captured, it's you're not going to be able to invalidate that server side unless you actually rotate that that key that secret token. So that's kind of a you know, that's that's the bad part of a uh, of storing that cookie on a, the client. So you don't want this to get out, that's my point. Uh, so you can see what we did was we went ahead and retrieved, instead of the help and stuff PDF, we retrieved the uh, secret token. And now with this value, we can 
go ahead and uh, you know sign the sign sessions and forge sessions, and uh, you know maybe change our user ID and the cookie from four or five or whatever it is to uh, one and become admin. So that is the uh, uh, last part of that. Or exit. I don't know if I'm that smarter. So um, this is the part where I kind of, uh, again, ask if anybody has some questions before I, I kind of sign off here and, you know, before I give you some information on how to reach us and then uh, sign off. Um, so does anybody have any questions before we do that? I think you've done a great job, Ken. Sorry, what, what was that? I said it looks like you've done a great job explaining all this. Oh, okay. So no questions, gotcha. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so my Twitter handle is uh, on there, um, Mike McCabe, who if you have any questions, I mean, Mike, Mike is uh, doing a lot more work than just unit testing. Um, behind the scenes, but, uh, you know, that's, especially if you have those questions, I would direct them at him. Um, I know he loves to answer all your questions and loves that I just said that he wants to answer <laughs> all the questions. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, the, correct me if I'm wrong, Kate, this is going out there so everybody can, uh, you know, go and download the, or can download the presentation, get the links that they need. Yeah, it, um, the presentation and the slides will be posted, and um, along with Ken and Mike's contact information and the um, the project page links also. So, lots of ways to get follow up information and reach out to either Ken or Mike um, in the future when you're you're working with it and you have some questions then. Yeah, I mean, there's always Google, <laughs> so, you know, if you Google Rails, you, you can um, get involved that way, uh, or find a way to get involved. Um, so, yeah, please contribute. Uh, that's all I have. I really appreciate your time. Okay, thanks for joining.